Now we kick off with uh, looking at China, looking at Asia in general, and and I thought this was kind of a good way to pair it all together, looking at China GDP, you know, PPP adjusted, and, and looking at it across all the different segments. And you can see the, the view of, you know, where that China GDP adjustment is, is really coming into. And again, there, there's always that, that confrontation of, well, how do you really calculate it? You know, where is nominal versus real? And, you know, the, we still remain, the U.S. still remains at the highest level. It's just a matter of when we start to look at what are these adjustments going forward, there's a lot to consider when we think about, you know, where some of the pain is going to be. And, and again, Europe is going to continue to struggle and the U.S. is trying to right a ship. But China is the one that's good, that has so far outpaced, but where is it starting to slow? And we're starting to see some of those pain factors that we continue to highlight, you know, throughout the market in general. That that continue to kind of prop prop up. Now this is a, a an important slide. Just looking at you know a most recent issue in Sikkim, where the uh, the Chinese and Indian military uh, came to blows again. And now you're technically not allowed to carry firearms because these are highly contested areas. So they instead they end up revi- uh, you know resorting to you know hand to hand combat you know, sticks, stones, things of just, you know, defending yourselves or attacking one another. But again, there, it's just, it's just showing how in the, in the dead of winter, we still have these issues. We still have this strife. We still continue to see this struggle. So when we get to the, the, the spring thaw, it's going to be a question of, well, what is going to happen now that we, we had all these problems during, even in the winter, you've seen, you know, in Sikkim, they, they, they rushed, uh, enforcements, uh, closer. They, and this happened right before they, the both militaries met to talk about a complete and immediate de-escalation. Again, saying it is one thing. And that's why we always talk about rhetoric. We always talk about what, what are we seeing written but where are the where are the assets? Where are the personnel? Where is the the equipment? Where are you hardening positions? Where are you building new positions? Clearly, the, you can say a lot, but this is not going away anytime soon. And the India China struggle or strife is only going to get worse, especially as we go into the spring thaw. And now, before we you know get into the the kind of backdrop, we want to look at okay, well, let's look at virus by the thousands. So this is, you know, the numbers are a bit different. So it's really 83,000, you know, total active cases, 184,000. Again, these are, these are positives in general. So India continues to see a trend in the right direction. The vaccines have started to increase. The question is going to be, do they have enough? Can they get it to the right areas? In the meantime, the lockdown index remains elevated at that 69 that we saw through the end of November, all through December. Again, trying to mitigate against a potential spread from Diwali and other um, holidays as we saw a little bit of an increase. And now we continue to see a, a, a fairly steady abatement of total active cases. Consumer sentiment is starting to recover a bit. Again, still low. Retail recreation still remaining uh, de- depressed. Flight departures, obviously nothing cr- uh, surprising there. The bigger issue, then when we think about where do we get to some normalcy, it's going to be the consumer sentiment, which remains L- uh, which remains under pressure. Congestion index, which has gotten better, which when we think about gasoline demand has gotten better, but still not back to where it was. And, it's, and if you look at just retail uh, recreation, it, it'll remain fairly conservative, especially with lockdown indexes staying uh, elevated and some of the cases still there. Now, they are still trying to find ways to mitigate against additional um, cases now that we have new variants. But this is this isn't the only issue. You know, we, we just talked about the China India uh, confrontation. We've also had a uh, India has announced that they uh, they again cut more apps from their app stores. They're they're putting more sanctions on Chinese assets. The <laughs> this isn't going away, and this is only going to get worse. And as these economies become more nationalistic, turning inward, trying to to protect their own, that's going to create even more strife. When you look at some of these, you know, very fluid borders in terms of who owns what and where, which is going to become a much bigger problem. And, you know, harking back to 
Biden talking about increasing uh, their, you know, increasing or the executive order is talking about climate, Paris Accord, you know, but then in the same breath wants to get aggressive with China. You know, we have we've continued to maintain our our stance that China is committing genocide. There is a significant amount of impact to trade to, you know, the what's happening in the nine dash line. You know, on on uh, Twitter, we were talking about the 15 inch line and we were talking about a lot of the issues when we're looking at just Chinese food where they don't have enough food. They're going out and purchasing more and more because they have 21% of the world's population, 6% of the world's arable land. A large part of that is sitting, uh, you know, the population lives on that arable land and you have the 15 inch line, which again, you need 15 inches of rain or, or more to have to, uh, you know, essentially grow. And a large part of the country falls below that number. So again, you hinder a significant amount, but they do have a lot of raw materials. So when you look at how are they trying to adjust, and and so let's look at China. So raw materials in China, natural graphite, synthetic graphite, they control 50% or more of the market. The chemical processing for lithium and graphite, they, you know, they control 57% and 100% of graphite. Anode cathode production, anode is 86%, cathode is 70%. And manufacturing on battery cell is 75% of the market. So China is 75% of the battery cell market. So we want to increase, we want to increase the amount of uh, renewables. We want to increase the amount of renewable cars, but we also want to sanction China and, and show on how they've caused all these issues, but yet we rely on them so much. Now we look at market dominance share of production by region in 2020. Lithium, you know, it, let's look at natural graphite, synthetic graphite, battery cell manufacturing. Again, the this is why when we talk about, you know, why BMW doing what it's doing when it's trying to create new assets and and when the, well, I shouldn't say just assets. They're trying to create new batteries and the batteries are supposed to get away from rare earths. So by doing that, they're doing it with Jaguar and Land Rover, who is owned by Tata. Tata is an Indian company. So India, China, uh, India and BMW, or India and Germany, are trying to team up to come up with a battery technology that alleviates some of these problems. So what are some other issues that we're seeing? We're seeing a huge shortage in semiconductors, there, where now... The problem is the you know, when we look at Volkswagen, Toyota, they've had a slow production. Why? Because they can't get chips. And it's caused by two different things. Obviously, COVID was an issue. Huawei in China rushed out and bought as many chips as they could to protect themselves from U.S. sanctions. Again, U.S. sanctions that were coming from human rights violations, trade violations, while we're relying on them more and more while sanctioning you know, you know, fossil fuels for the most part. Again, not to say that we shouldn't tr- do things to make our economy better and our environmental situation better, but this is something that we need to address of if we really want this rollout, if we really want to ad- see this adoption, we need to get away from China's reliance reliance on China and, and really try to get into some form and some partnerships with not only Europe, but other areas like India that are a huge driver and or will inherently be a big market for some of these products. Now, when we look at manufacturing share for excavator sales in China, China is becoming more and more self-sufficient. And this is where we continue to see the struggle with trade. As we look at the RCEP and other means uh, like US and Europe continue to be fairly small, Europe wants to become a bigger part of it, but China does not want that. They have created the Belt and Road Initiative. They've created their entities to be a fairly self-contained to avoid some of the reliance that they've had as early as 2006 seven where China was 20% of their market. You know, South Korea was was another 30%. You had Japan. They they want to become more self-reliant and that's just putting that overcapacity into the market. Again, these are the the shifts that we're seeing just in 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 terms of just general activity, which is going to be a bigger problem. And then when we look at GDP. So this is a part where we want to pause for a second and talk about some of the structures that we're seeing in China. So China, it, Chinese banks issued per, perpetual bonds. 
So some of the perpetual bonds had had equity kickers on it where they can turn into equity. Some of the PBOC bought some, but a lot of a lot of equally sized banks bought other banks perpetual bonds. So think of let's just think that through. So you issue a perpetual bond to strengthen your balance sheet. So your balance sheet was struggling, so you issued a perpetual bond to strengthen that. Then a bank then purchased that perpetual bond with the idea that they were going to continue to get that interest rate and that you know, feed through in order to help protect their own balance sheet. Now, think about the how that continues to roll through the system and the contagion behind that if one bank fails. So if one bank fails and they have a perpetual bond, well, then that perpetual bond goes away or the PBOC has to step in. How many times has that happened and have we seen this go through, especially when we look at the inherent leverage and the amount of debt in, in, in China. So, you know, when people talk about, well, their debt is, is local. Okay. It's local, but this comes down to where, what is the collateral? Where do we see collateral and how many times has that collateral been counted? Because when we look at the collateral conundrum, you see multiple assets that are being used to collateralize multiple different bonds or multiple different assets and loans. And, and this is where that, that bifurcation could happen, where you think you're covered, you think you have the asset, but you bought the perpetual bond and now their balance sheet's getting worse. They, you find out that they have made these poor investments across the board. And because it's an SOE, uh, it, because it, you know they, they were investing in state-owned enterprises, they thought they were safe and now they're not. And this is why when we get to this chart, we look at the share of GDP as a percentage. So the South keeps growing, North keeps getting worse. And, you, and this is where who has the leverage and who has what, which is why it's important to understand whose perpetual bonds own what. How much is the, is the South exposed to the North? How much is the North exposed to the South? Is there, this is where there's, there's this separation and could, could this create more strife as we look at, as we look at the pain, you know, not only in the U.S., but also in China on retail sales, on, on just, you know, immobility or, or social inequality, you know, there remains an issue between South and North. And, you know, some, some individuals that don't study China, like, like us, you know, they were like, oh, you know, North and South, it's not that simple. Like, it's not like the U S it's like, well, it's not, but it ended up being like that. When you look at the North being the weaker side of the economy, the South being the stronger side of the economy and the South, if you think about where that the civil war took place in the fifties, you know, a lot of those individuals escaped South into Taiwan, into Hong Kong, into, into the Philippines and just out away from the attacks of, of the communist uh, Mao regime. So again, these are the differences. These are the problems that we're seeing. And there's a perpetual issue that we have on not only debt levels, but what is the collateral backing that debt? And where is the shadow banking? And where is the underlying growth? Because we, they keep moving these numbers. And that's why in the last, the last week, we went so in depth into what are the real numbers? What was restruck? What is GDP actually? Because it just means that all of this is that much worse than expected because of that restrike, which is when we look at China is now taking a backseat in Korean exports. So when we look at, at, at exports for China, where are we seeing exports going? And Korea is moving away from China. We, you know, there, was, there was news out today that Apple is now moving more of their manufacturing to Vietnam and India. We keep seeing this movement. Now, it's not only because China is China, but there's a semiconductor issue. You, know, you have smartphones. We had two new cycles of sort, smartphones, we, which we always do, but it's just they were so quote-unquote new with 5G, a lot of people went out to buy them. So you had this shift. Now, uh, car manufacturing, car purchasing came back much stronger, much faster than your manufacturers, than the economists myself thought was going to happen. So here you have now this shortage of, of chips, which created this backdrop of a shortage of technology, a shortage of the, but again, these are things that are continue to, to crop up when we're starting to look at where is China going to win and lose over the longer term. 
And when you look at, again, surging demand, Taiwanese export orders increased at fastest pace since 2010. Why? Because Taiwan is exporting so many chips, and now they've just received new contracts to be the provider of their semiconductors because there's such a shortfall. So if you think about the, the perception within China, China wants to become a much bigger part of the semiconductor industry, as we talked about in our in our Chinese show of uh, China China's uh, communism rising, which we'll I'll post in the comments just to kind of link back to them, and uh, and and just tr understand how we're trying to connect the dots and how each one tries to link link into the other. This is going to make China look worse. Why? Because Taiwan continues to outperform way more than China, even after COVID, even after with some of the numbers. And this is, again, going to create more strife. They've, they've pushed another eight. Um, they, they've, uh, China flew eight uh, aircraft or 15 aircraft into Taiwanese territory. We sent uh, an aircraft carrier showing support. Again, this all happened under Biden. This is not that we keep trying to beat this home, uh, you know, drive this home. We will not see a change in policy under Biden than as we did under Trump, just because this is the trajectory that we're on. And that's why when we look at, OK, well, let's look at other underlying components and home sales are, are, are continuing to move lower. And, and this is, again, like when we last week when we talked about fixed investment, when we talked about uh, real estate, the real estate side is really starting to cool off. And it's coming to the, the the consumer struggling if we look at retail sales, if we look at imports. You know, we're seeing this this difference where exports are strong, not saying they aren't. Imports are weak. Residential is weakening. Retail is weakening. And this is some of this truth serum that's leaking out that we're starting to see that, okay, well, how are you going to, to continue this? And the PBOC is saying we're not. We want this to slow down because we need to cool off the market because there is too much debt, there's too much leverage, there's too much risk. And how much of that can happen because it should in economics versus what the PBOC will allow to happen. And then when we look at you know the, the coal side, because now it comes down to what are the costs for China to continue to operate? We know steel mills are, act, are, are operating under negative margins. We know rebar is negative. We know uh, HRC uh, steel is, is, is trending negative. Well, let's look at where China is uh, importing coal. Well, they're increasing their coal exponentially from Indonesia and cutting it into Australia. Now, the Australian coal is there. It's just stuck offshore in, in no man's land in this uh, per political, per, uh, you know, uh, political purgatory that they, it's just not going anywhere. So they have to replace it with Indonesian coal. You're, it's coming, it's traveling a little bit further. It has to go through, uh, well, depending on where, what port it's going into. It has to, you know, can you get enough? Is the price is high enough? Is it the right grade or the right type of BTU value to replace Australia? All of these are leading to an increase in local prices, which will put pressure on exports, which will put pressure on the local consumer, and how can they compete in the international market? Now there's pain and experiences. Look at the seven-day shy bore. You saw this huge spike into 3%. And by huge spike, I mean, obviously it went up a percentage point or so. But again, these are the concerns that we continue to see in the market, this, 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 this separation. Because while we talked about the importance of looking at the euro when we're considering U.S. dollar strength, we also, or, or you know, weakness, we have to look at what's happening with the yuan, with the renminbi. You know, where is there, is there going to be a movement out of this, out of some of these Chinese currencies and into the U.S. dollar? And that's where you know, we've seen short dollar, long renminbi, long yuan, and not to say that you can do it outright, but, you know, synthetically, that can start to unwind. And you're starting to see some of these shocks to the system as the PBOC is trying to adjust liquidity, trying to take liquidity out of the market, trying to move things about to try to offset and cool off some of the expansion that we've seen. And when we look at, you know, where is the uh, the um, the risk? And, and we've talked about this before, the investment has been from China and U.S. into Africa. This comes full circle back to where is their collateral? What is the revenue generation? How much dollar amount is exposed 
based on where things are. And China has the most exposure to Africa, where we've seen the largest increase in, in, in extreme poverty. We've seen a, a big increase in, or a decrease in food security. All of these things just lend China to being more exposed to potential risks and shocks in the market that will reverberate through the system. How much of them are coming from the uh, Chinese Agriculture Bank? How many, you know, did they issue perpetual bonds? If they did, who bought those perpetual bonds? And again, you're starting to see how the linkage can happen and how you can get a contagion moving throughout the whole system. That would be a big problem in terms of taking massive mark to markets and seeing this huge shift, which is why I remain concerned not only on Chinese GDP growth, but how competitive is it in the market? And if they need to change narrative, China will have to blame someone. And who are they going to blame? Again, coming back to narrative, coming back to shifts in terms of who will be at fault. And this is why when we look at foreign direct investment inward and outward flows of stocks. So China had to overtook the U.S. in terms of foreign direct investment. This has been a positive as the as China's opened up the bond market, uh, their bond market. You know they've gone into uh, into some key global indices, which has pulled more money, foreign money, into China. Now, is that going to increase or is that going to slow as we head into Q1? You know, an increase in COVID, an increase, a decrease in Lunar New Year travel. These are going to be some of those impacts that we think is going to be a bit stickier, especially when you see pain or political strife now between China and India. You know, you you have you have Germany and and Europe in general starting to rely on Taiwan a bit more. South Korea, not importing as much from China. You have the U.S. starting to adjust a bit. You know, you have the supply chain that is normalized a little bit. So you should start to see some pressure on Chinese exports. Again, these are things that the investments, India is one that we think is going to continue to see support because again, it's India or China, you know, Vietnam or China, you know, and not to say that it's one or the other, but it's going to be a percentage. If I can do 60% in in Vietnam in India, 20% in in Vietnam, then I maybe I have to do 20% in China or am I going to try am I already doing 50-50, 50% in India, 50% in China, I'm going to increase India and I'm going to increase Vietnam or start Vietnam and decrease China. That's going to shift where the these foreign direct investments are going, which is why the Chinese FDI is going to be very important to see and how competitive is that versus India, Vietnam, Indonesia, and I think some of the other RCEP nations because RC, RCEP nations, in the, or I should say in the trade group of the, or which are the uh, ASEN 10, those countries will see more uh, investment flow that I think is going to take from China, take a little bit from India, and you'll see some of this shift in terms of where those dollars are going. But where are these Chinese startups? Because again, the money has to go somewhere. And what are those startups going? What has been incentivized? And China's startup investments over the past 10 years have started, did slow in 2020 because you had a, a big sweep of bankruptcies. You had guys kind of adjusting the way they were investing so that you had to clear the deck, which again is a positive. So the PBOC said, we need to let some state-owned enterprises, some, some larger enterprises, some small you know, components, start to to go bankrupt to clean the system clear the glut to try to get back to some growth and normalcy the question is going to be what how big is that glut and how how unstable because if you look at the rhetoric the rhetoric is t trying to support small and medium enterprises which continue to struggle they have not recovered from from the uh, from the covid lull in in Q1 of 2020 and that's been a big overhang coming to where does that foreign direct investment go and are they going to start to see returns or are they going to shift elsewhere? I think they shift elsewhere. And that's when we turn to this, again, where are the startups in? Well, they're in semiconductors and biotech and data. The biggest component, again, dual circulation strategy, where is China trying to focus? What is Xi talking about? He keeps talking about national security, self-reliance, local consumption, and it's all centered around tech. And that's why where we sh will continue to see this this shift higher in terms of what is going to see the most investments as startups. But 
semiconductor, biotech, and data saw the biggest bankruptcies. So again, there's going to be this, this concern on what is good, what is bad, what is a shell corporation, what has real value as they try to build out the economy in general. And that's when we start to look at, okay, South Korea was one that we mentioned, and South Korea remains uh, under a, string, a stringency index of 64. It's gone up, you know, pretty much a point every single time this has been struck. New COVID cases actually spiked a little bit after coming back down, and you're seeing this reverberate through the system in terms of recreation, traffic, you know, just what people are doing. Again, coming full circle to pain in the market, people slowing activity, slowing energy, slowing economic prowess. Again, these are things that are going to become a bigger problem. But South Korean exports will uh, will continue to be strong. Imports, while they'll pair, pair back a little bit, they will remain strong and will most likely surprise to the upside over the next go round. Now, when we look at the uh, the Hong Kong, just to kind of look at what are different pieces of China doing, because Hong Kong is the tech center for China, you get a lot of chips, a lot of semiconductors, a lot of activity from the tech industry going back into China, where you have a prolonged outbreak in parts of Hong Kong, which is going to weigh on the uh, the economic prowess of of HK into China. And again, these are things that are going to weigh on how active, how quick can China recover. And, and this is why they needed a reset. So what's the best way to reset? Limit travel. Show that you you had to miss you know estimates because Lunar New Year was a risk and you had to mitigate against the spread of COVID. So you had to pare back activity. So Q1 is going to disappoint versus expectations. It's obviously going to be better than last year, but it's going to disappoint. And then you know the disappointment is going to lead into Q2. And again, trying to control the narrative is key. So I know we, we went through a lot, uh, you know, we'll have more to come because this is obviously a very complex topic with a lot of different components, especially when we look at China and some of these new uh, setups. So if you want us to see a, a show more on different things, we're going to do, we're going to start to do one on the green um, initiative and movement, the supply chain behind it. You know, we keep talking about coming in with the, uh, the update to, you know, the benefits of U.S. Uh, fracturing and, and U.S. energy. And these are things that we're all going to start to put together and try to create more evergreen shows. So if you have any, any suggestions, please let us know. And uh, thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Mm-hmm.